On this week's episode, I'm joined by Joao Garcia. Joao is a professional mountain climber, a guide, a motivational speaker, and an author. He is one of 15 people to climb 14 of the highest mountains in the world without oxygen. And he did this all with a Portuguese flag in his pocket. And this is some of his story. Welcome back, or welcome to another episode of Portugal, The Simple Life. And I'm really delighted to be joined here by Joao Garcia. Joao, thank you for joining us and, and how are you? Hello, uh, thank you for the invitation and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm well, thank you. Um, so as an introduction, I'm a mountain climber. It's uh, not normal to have a professional mountain climber um, on a country where the mountains are so low. And I live in Lisbon um where there are no no mountains but everything started a long time ago with the wish of having something that we cannot have i think it's the law of economics you you, you give more value to something that you you cannot have so i have the beach uh, all, all my life uh, we have the sea and it's so close so uh, so near, so but the mountains, the, these mountains with uh, with snow, with, uh, with with some altitude, I cannot have. I have everywhere uh, I go for for mountaineering. I have to drive two hours, three hours to Serra da Estrela. I have to drive ten hours to the to the Spanish Pyrenees. I have to drive twenty four hours to the French Alps. Um, so you give value, you know, you, you appreciate more because it, it costs a lot of time, uh, in, in my life, but going a little bit uh, further back, I was a boy scout when I was young and still today, I have very good memories of uh, these young people dressed like boy scouts that follows uh, a grown-up dressed like a little boy. <laughs> and our mountaineering was very simple, just a, a backpack and we would go camping and hiking. And, and then at the age of 12, 14, we were introduced into ropes and knots and upsailing. We would go around the cliff and do this upsailing and these radical techniques and and I was very excited mm -hmm. about all this uh, I was learning, but I wanted more. I mean, um, you know, young people are curious and it's, it's normal. So my curiosity w was in the big mountains, who, who goes around the cliff to set the, set the rope? I mean, how, how do you climb big mountains? And I wasn't uh, looking, I, I, I wasn't finding those, those answers. Uh, you know, I'm from Lisbon. Um, and I heard that there would be a mountaineering gathering during summer in Serra da Estrela, which is a 2,000 meter massive, but it's 300 kilometers away from, from Lisbon. At the time, I was 15 years old. So I decided to go and, and join. I joined that, that meeting, that mountaineering meeting. It took me like four days to reach Serra da Estrela because I went by a bicycle. You know, when, when you are 15, you don't have a driving license. You don't have a car. I had a bicycle and that bicycle at the time used to take me everywhere. So why not to Serra da Estrela? Of course, it was not that simple. Mainly convinced my parents to allow me to go alone to Serra da Estrela on a bicycle. And I had a plan. I elaborated a plan. I would... I would cycle during four days. I would sleep in a camping park where I could phone home. And I had to take all these camping gear. And basically, I went to Serra da Estrela and I met these amazing people. And they fulfilled uh, most of my curiosity and my needs to, to progress as a, a climber. And I started rock climbing. Um, the next year, I went with a group from uh, Guarda, which is a city next to Serra da Estrela. I went with them to, to the French Alps. I climbed Mont Blanc. And it was 
really tough, you know, at the age of 16 to climb uh, 4,800 high without the adjustment of the body to the altitude. It was really hard, but I, I could, I did it, you know, uh, I worked hard and, and I was able to, to, to understand that this is a fair sport. I mean, only those who work really hard will reach the top, not those who have better equipment or have more money or speak uh, better. Or, and I worked so hard and make such an effort to, to reach this, this, this summit that uh, it makes a click in my mind. I mean, uh, it makes sense. It's not like many other sports that those who have more money, they will win. You know, you have more money, you buy, you buy the best players, you win. Or you buy the best engines and you win. Here in the mountains, everything is so simple and so fair. Mm. So it convinced me at the age of 16. Yeah. And also something that make a click uh, is that when we, we all went back to the camping site, um, I found out I was no longer a young kid among adults, I had become one of them. You know, it's like an initiation process. Uh, for, for me, um, th this was happiness. Uh, I mm -hmm. came back home with these nice feelings of happiness. And so I never stopped. You know, this is a sport that shares the same philosophical base of other sports that basically the sports person wants to overcome his feet. So I climbed 4,800 now. I want to try 5,000. Well, what's the feeling and the, the difficulty of overcoming 5,000 meters high, the, the thin air, the, all the, the snow and ice uh, technical uh, difficulties and so on. So I never stopped. Um, more than 45 years ago, uh, I started something that I've never imagined that uh, would become my, mm -hmm. my, my job, my, Amazing. my passion, my, my way of life. Amazing. So, I, I mean, um, one of the, the things that I've, that I've really uh, noticed um, and appreciated here about Portuguese people is their curiosity. You mentioned curiosity. You were curious to find out, okay, but how did the ropes get up there in the first place? Yeah. Um, what do you think in your upbringing here in Portugal and, and growing up as a, a young boy in Lisbon, um, what do you think contributed to your to, to that curiosity to foster it and to grow it? I don't know. I don't know. I think it, it, it exists on every uh, 14, 15 year old child. I mean, it's, uh, you're growing up, there are lots of stuff you can get uh, from school or from your parents, but there is another, a lot of p uh, things that, that you don't know. So you have to, it's part of your life to, to make an effort to, to search for that, that information. Now you have internet, you can ask Google about everything, but at the time there was no, not this kind of resources. There was some kind of books and encyclopedias. Um, I remember to look for alpinismo in British encyclopedia and, and there was only two images uh, and it was old fashioned and there were some players like historical players. And, and but that, that's it, I mean, when I went to, to, to Chamonix, to, to the French Alps, I went to a library and I was amazed. Wow, so many books about this subject. So uh, at the time, I could not buy all the books I wanted. So I would take photocopies. I would pay for photocopies of certain pages and I would bring all that information home to, to study, to, to, to learn. Well, I think we need to we need to give your your parents uh, uh, some credit. I mean, they let you cycle yeah. <laughs> to Serra de Estrela. Yeah. Uh, that's that's amazing. It's a different generation. I mean, um, it's not that they were not aware of of the dangers. I, I was uh, I was against. I, I mean, still today I cycle, and I'm I'm afraid to say that. 
cycling in Portuguese uh, roads, it's more dangerous than climbing Everest. I mean, because there, there is not um, uh, a cycling culture or, or, a, uh, or simply a respect of a person that is using a car and respect the person that is using a bicycle. It's not the size of, of, of the, the bicycle or car. It's one person and one person. And people don't see it like that. And so, uh, I mean, um, they, they, they never encouraged me doing anything, but they never said no. They just let us, me and my brothers, uh, they, they would uh, let us uh, do uh, things that we loved. And I think that that's the key of success of mm -hmm. many successful people is that, that they put a lot of passion. And, and so it's this passion that helps you overcome a lot of uh, difficulties. Well, it's, I mean, it's not everywhere in the world that that um, it's safe enough to do what you did as a as a as a sixteen year old cycling all the way to. How did you communicate with them? Because uh, now we know you have mobile phones and WhatsApp and texting. How yeah. did you let them know that you were safe uh, while you were while you were cycling for those four or five days? Uh, I, that's one of the reasons why they. Uh, asked me to, to sleep on uh, camping parks is because there would be a, a phone, a fixed line phone at the time it was, that's all that there was. And, and I would call uh, every, every evening at the same time to let them know that uh, everything was going according to the plan. And, and still today, I love to plan my, my adventures. And it was this planning that helped me convince my father, you know, uh, he was the final deci decision maker. And um, I, I told him that I would cycle about 80 kilometers every, every day. And he was, he was looking at maps or a roadmap. And on the other side, I would know exactly all the, uh, what to say, all the, the mileage, you know, all the roads, all the segments. I, I knew it by by memory because I've studied my, I did my homework. So uh, on the other side, he was amazed. Wow! So you know what you are doing. So how can I say no to, to someone who has invested so much? Um, yeah. I wish but I was a that good student at the school subject. Uh, I've never been a, a good <laughs> student. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know what that's about. But I, I believe that. So he was the practical one who th said, hey, he's got a plan. It could work. Your mother was the one waiting by the phone every evening, uh, yeah. making sure you, you called. Did you call on time each time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, never um, uh, uh, an issue. Um, but once um, I, I'm from a generation that even in Nepal, I would go to, to, to Kathmandu and then I would call my mother saying, yeah, um, it, it was an expensive call at the time. Mm. And then I remember looking at my watch. I have one minute, like 55 seconds to say a message. Yes, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have arrived. I met the group that the Polish climbers are look okay. And uh, we're going to leave in two days from Kathmandu. So see you back in 50 days. Bye bye. And that's it for 50 days, no, no more news. This was up to 2000. Uh, after the year 2000, uh, satellite phones were no longer like a, a very expensive item. And the, the communications were no longer $10 a minute. It was like $1 a minute. So I could buy one, I could afford. And, and so from... Uh, the last uh, millennium to, to the actual millennium, there, there, were, there has been a change like um, night to day. You can get uh, the weather forecast. You can get a lot of information. You can get worries. You know, sometimes people uh, sometimes call me, ah, you're so selfish because I'm, I'm there. I'm, uh, I have to be focused on, on my climbs. And, and so I say, yeah, it's just to let you know everything is okay, but I don't want to know anything about home. If you have, um, sorry, I'm 8,000 kilometers away. If you have some kind of issue, I, I cannot help you. So 
or you know i just yeah. kind of there is this communication tool but i don't want to know I, i i want to be isolated There's maybe climbing uh, away from home it's a way of looking for like 30 40 days of uh, isolation sometimes you need to to be away you know you need to have your own space and, and have a room i mean um tell us a little bit joao how from how um I mean, you got you mentioned that you had the click and that you fell in love with the sport and the people involved with it as well um maybe tell us a little bit about how the transition went from being a boy to to doing it professionally and then i mean you've had some amazing 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 accom- accomplishments um tell us a bit about those as well um well um to be honest i, I was hearing Uh, some minutes ago, uh, one of your interviews, and there's something that I have to share. And this uh, professional, international cameraman was saying that Lisbon is the way we come back. It's our home. And most people have a home. But when we do this traveling, going to Pakistan or to to Nepal or Tibet for, for climbing big mountains, It's something that I really need is, is to know that we have a home waiting for us. Uh, sometimes it's where we get the strength on, on difficult uh, moments. And, and so the, the, the click was when one of my climbing partners here in Portugal, he, he was the, the first Portuguese to climb a 7,000 meter high mountain and a night at 8,000 meter high mountain. And uh, we, we've climbed for 10 years together. We, we knew each other very well. So on, on my mind, uh, if he can do it, so can I. So if he can, if he did a 8,000 meter mountain, so I think I can climb it as well. So I went for a try and in the beginning went like um, just a test. And then the second 8,000, uh, I've, I've climbed like another test just to be sure that I wasn't only uh, lucky. And then, you know, it's, it's like this, this, um, this snowball. The more it rolls, the more it compacts. And, and so um, the, to become a professional climber, it, it was like um, a need I mean, um, that there is a moment that I could, you know, uh, save money and program my life uh, during two, two years so that I could afford uh, climbing a, a big, another big mountain. But then I, I had this project and I was this, uh, motivated to climb all these 14 mountains above 8,000. At the time, it was a very... Uh, daring um, dream because when I started to to embrace this project only two people in the world had had uh, completed this and one is Reinhold Messner he's from from Italy he has uh, Dolom- Dolomite mountains and he, so he can train and, and then the other one Erard Loretain he's from uh, Switzerland and also he has all these mountains to, 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 to get ready. And, and then me from Lisbon, I have Serra de Sintra nearby, 600 meters only. <laughs> and I, I think we Portuguese, we are as good as anyone else. I mean, I, I never had this kind of, um, of, of uh, complex issues, but I, I needed to accelerate because um, I, I, it took me like 12 years to climb six of these big mountains. And so at this speed, it would took me forever to, to finish the, the 14. So I had to, to find a sponsorship and a way so that I could do it uh, more professionally, more uh, quicker and safer. So uh, I was able to, to show my sport in, in television. I started collaborating with a 
television network. And so I showed the society that, well, uh, mountain climbing is also a, a sport uh, with, along with the new technologies that we can give the feedback that the sponsorships they, they need. So um, I, I was able really to, to become a professional climber, just be paid to climb mountains, which is like a dream and also a almost um, impossible mission for a, a climber in, in a country where there are no, no mountains. So um, this is what I, I did in 2010. I was able to finish my uh, last uh, 8,000 meter mountains and I became the 10th person in the world to, to do this. Um, still today, as we speak, only 15 people in the world have been able to climb all 14 8,000ers and they are all in Pakistan and Himalaya, both Tibet Edible. and Nepal side. And um, from then, well, um, most people ask me, well, you've climbed them all, so you're going to stop. And I said, no, there's still so much to do, so much uh, mountains to, to be climbed. So uh, the, the change was not to, to keep climbing in quantity, you know, the highest, but mm -hmm. more, more steep uh, routes uh, or climb where no one has ever climbed before, exploring uh, over 6,000 meter mountains, uh, which are not so, uh, so, so costly. You know, these mountains are in these poor countries and they demand royalties for, for climbing them. And Mount Everest is, the, the most expensive one and you can understand why because everyone wants to try but uh, a small uh, 6,000 meter mountain it's peanuts you, you can afford with our own money um, so lately uh, I, I've been able to well not the past year and a half because of the pandemics but um, before I, I could afford and go just with a friend and, and do these new routes, which is uh, exploring, which is the base of uh, mountain climbing, it's the the altitude that is difficult, the, the the fact that we are going for more steep routes, uh, more steep, more technical, and sometimes doing, trying to climb where no one has climbed before, you know, not even knowing if it is possible. Mm. Um, so this is like a. Um, a mental difficulty it's like mm. extra difficulty and that that's exactly what we are looking for it's uh, difficult things easy things that does not uh, fascinate me so amazing uh, joao um <clears throat> you mentioned you're the 10th man to to climb all 14 of those uh, peaks that are above 8000 yes. um how many portuguese have done it no one else. Uh, You're the only, I'm the only, the only Portuguese. Portuguese. There is like a couple Spanish, there are Swiss and three or four Italians. And there is one Equatorian, there is one uh, Ukrainian, there is a Vike case from Finland, and one American, uh, visitors. There is uh, Karlinda is from Austria. And, um, and there is like... A, Ukrainian, uh, we are 15. It's a, it's a really small, small, small number. group. How um, do you, I mean, on, on, I saw on, on your website, uh, you must have carried that little um, Portuguese flag in your pocket somewhere. Uh, yeah. How does it feel to, to represent Portugal in, in, in that space uh, where no one else has before? Well, um, don't, don't, don't judge me wrong, but at the bottom line, you're climbing for yourself. So uh, I'm, I'm not going in a national mission, you know. Uh, I think even an Olympic sports person uh, is not there because of the flag. He's there because he worked hard so many years to try to achieve that moment. Uh, and that competition is important to him. Although climbing mountains is not a competition, uh, overcoming these 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 mountains, uh, including Mount Everest, being the first on so many mountains, the first Portuguese. Of course, I, I could 
I, I would take the, the Portuguese flag with with, uh, with a lot of pride, pride. But um, it's it's not the reason why why we do it. Uh, that was like 50 years ago. There, there would be national teams, and they they would do it with this. Uh, um, patriotic uh, purpose, but it's not like that anymore. Yeah, and you you also mentioned about um, having your home here and yeah. having that in your mind that you had something to come back to and how it helped you in difficult moments. Um, I mean, can you describe some of those moments and how it helped? Well. Um, Firstly, I have to talk about about Lisbon, and I'm I'm the product of so many families that I met. My father also from north, my mother from south. They meet in Lisbon, looking for work, and and they make a family. So I also have a little a little bit of uh, genetics from both north and, and south, and and so I have also all these uh, cultural things. And, and in culture, there is the food, there is the, the way we speak. And so um, it's, it's all this together that, that we take when, when we go abroad. Uh, I feel like an ambassador uh, where young people like uh, ask me, where are you from? People, local people. Uh, hello, sir. Where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Portugal. Oh, Luis Figo and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, yeah. They the, they play soccer, and um, people ask us about our food. People ask us about our language, and you know, local people. Um, it's not like that anymore now. Uh, all these young people are Facebook generation. But um, I remember visiting people that had never seen a television. So speaking with foreigners, it's a way of like reading a newspaper, getting uh, information, so knowing something new. And, and so uh, not only abroad, I, I feel like uh, an ambassador of my country, but um, on, on these, like I said, on these difficult moments, it's knowing um, that I have somewhere to, to, to go back to uh, family um, <laughs> and especially food, good food we have. Uh, when, when you are in an expedition, a climbing expedition, food is terrible. I mean, uh, lo local food is good, but when you are sitting on ice, one, two, three, four weeks, all the fresh food is gone. It's raw. Either it's frozen or rotten or it's gone. It's just canned food or, or pasta or rice. Um, and, and, and so you cannot make miracles with, with uh, so much, with so little, um, so little ingredients and fresh uh, aliments. So it's something that uh, uh, may, makes you have cravings. You dream about food. You know, um, and, and of course, even basic things at the end of an, a climbing expedition, there is no more sugar, no more coffee, no more <laughs> chocolate, no more nothing, all the good stuff. Uh, and sometimes I take chorizo and I take a nice ham, you know, the presunto, salty presunto. And also, you can imagine when you sweat, you, your body loses a lot of salt. So on your cravings, it's natural to, to be wanting for salty food. But all the pistachio, salty pistachio I take and salty peanuts and, and the, the, the presumed, everything is gone. It's finished at the end of a... So it's like a torture, but at the same time, is the reminder that we are going home. And all this is temporary. And um, yeah, coming, coming back home, and to this wonderful country uh, with a very good uh, f uh, climate for, for training, um, it, it's, a, it, it's a blessing. It's also it's a pleasure. It's a, it's a must. Like an American friend says, going up to the mountains, it's optional. Coming back is mandatory. 
I like that. Uh, what do you, I mean, what's your go-to food that you think of when you're up there? What do you um, miss the most? Food, uh, I'm not much of a seafood, you know. Really? Shellfish or, I, I'm, I'm more of this um, bacalhau. You, 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 we have like three, four different ways of preparing bacalhau, the codfish. Um, also because it's salty. Uh, people who, <laughs> who train every day, uh, we sweat. So we, we have like the need to, to put all these salts uh, back in, in our body. Um, and we have wonderful wine. We have wonderful and cheap wine for the quality. And, and so, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I love this. You know, before the meal, we have a lot of uh, entradas, you know, the, the thing that um, for, for a little snack. And for me, in certain restaurants or certain um, places of Portugal, just the entries, the, the, the startup, it, it's, it's a meal itself. I mean, I, I just yeah. eat like a nice soup and then a little chorizo and a little bread. Um, which is broa, which is like a very condensed bread, and then a little cheese, uh, and then I just jump directly to dessert because I'm already full, and like they they they, they laugh about life is short, so let's not skip uh, dessert. I mean, it's uh, I'm, I'm people who, who do a lot of sports also are a little um, how do you say? It? Uh, sugar tooth or something like that sweet tooth yeah 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 and so uh, yeah I, I like i think it's my body asking for quick sugar for 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 putting back the energy in, in our legs i mean mm -hmm. it's uh, just natural you, you mentioned how coming home is mandatory and and you also spoke about how Portugal is such a good place for training, you know, and we, I mean, this is obvious, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's a great place to run, to cycle. It's got good weather. You've got lots of outside space, uh, parks, things. I mean, you, today you said you're cycling in Monsanto, yeah. but I know I can imagine that um, climbing at those altitudes. I mean, you do all of this without oxygen as well, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so so um, I can imagine a lot of it is also mental. Um, how does this place, being coming home, prepare you mentally and, and help you mentally for, for, for those moments? Well, um, before I've, um, I've invested my life just for rock, climbing mountains, uh, I had other jobs. I was five years in the military, I was um, I was doing also uh, triathlon, which is swimming, cycling, and then running. And I think all these things in my past helped me shape my body into what I am now. Um, being military, I, I, ha I had to learn discipline. At the triathlon, you, you have a lot of volume in, on, on training. You have to you know, swimming, you have to cycle, you have to run. Um, it's, um, it it complements a lot of things that I do. So wh when I, I became like a professional climber, I, I realized that, well, all this is very useful. So this is a, a formula that is working. So I'm going to keep cycling and I'm going to keep uh, running. And, and, and still today, that's how I work. Uh, I prepare my body for, for these big mountains. But time to time, I have to go to the mountains to do this specific training, you know, with uh, uh, heavy boots and heavy backpacks and to, to, to get used to, to this specific equipment. And so all this together, all these two parallel uh, realities uh, have uh, proven for the past 20 years that uh, it is... It is working well, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy. And also, I think if I some people uh, mentioned that, well, I, I'm even curious, how, how come you're not already living in, in the Alps? Because you go so often to the Alps or to, 
to Spain. Uh, I think if I had like a big mountain next home, I would kind of lose interest. I think it's this distance that keeps um, making me uh, valorate, uh, giving the 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 the, the value um, of uh, working hard, preparing the best way possible, so that when I go to the mountains, uh, uh, I don't miss. Uh, I try to 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 be as as um, as um, as prepared as as possible. So I can be quick, and in the big mountains, uh, speed is is uh, is the same as uh, safety, because um, people don't realize that the the management, the risk management in the mountains is like the chaos theory. So everything is so bad, we opt for the way which is not so bad, and just being on the mountain is dangerous. So if I'm quick going up and down, I'm not risking so much my life. So it's one of the things that you can control is, is your preparation, is being fast in, in the mountains. And it, it's not training in the mountains that I'm going to be fast. It's training down here. And that's where I live. That's where the good food is. Um, there are three pillars on every athlete is the training, is the food, and is the, the recovery, which is being disciplined, sleeping well, um, giving time for the body to recover so that you can next day train, uh, not training just volume, but training with quality also. So uh, Lisbon is, is just perfect for, for that for me. Um, and then there is also little jobs I can do and I can complement that in, in my daily, uh, day to day. Wonderful. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like the greatest place, to, the greatest place to recover and eat Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and rest. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, Joao, this has been so fascinating. Um, but I mean, if you could choose one thing that you, you want people to remember from this conversation or to take away from this conversation, what would it be? Well, um, something that I have not mentioned yet is that uh, before, when I started, I was only a rock climber. And then rock climbing, of course, we have a lot of cliffs around Lisbon. Uh, and to do rock climbing, you can do like exploration, you know, and, and there are sports climbing. Sports climbing means that you're, you're um, climbing on a cliff where some of the gear is already in place. So the, the, the routes have been set it and it, it, it's much lighter. It's, um, I used to be a good rock climber, but I had an accident in 1999 and I froze by part of my fingers, so I could no longer be that rock climber. That's why I became more of a mountain climber, where my legs were still okay, my heart, my lungs, um, and climbing big mountains does not involve so much of grabbing rocks, and it's not, it's not extreme climbing. So um, I no longer climb rock like I used to, but I still enjoy. I still enjoy all the things uh, that you can do on a mountain, uh, which is the, 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 the hiking, uh, like the approach to the mountain, which is the rock climbing that I do time to times, um, that, that the climbing in, in, in Pyrenees, uh, 3000s and 4000s in the French Alps, and then the big mountains in Himalaya or Karakoram. So I, I think I, I have fulfilled myself doing a little bit of everything. You know, the variety, uh, for me, it's a blessing. Uh, otherwise, you get tired of doing always the same things. Um, training, just being, imagine being just a, a cyclist and cycling it's everything you do every day, every day, every day. I think I would become bored or, 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 or tired mentally. So 
uh, Lisbon, for me, it, it, it's a place where everyone who likes mountaineering, everyone who likes both the sea and the rock, it, it, it's, a, it's a paradise because there are so many cliffs. I have friends that are only, they don't go to the big mountains, they are only rock climbers. And, and at the same time, they do surfing. You know, they, sometimes when, when the head is no longer uh, working on, on the solving the problems or rock climbing, because so rock climbing is like solving little problems. Now I have to go this, this meter. I have only these holes and it's solving problems. And, and a lot of the, the problem solving is, is on, our, on our minds. So these friends, when it's not working, they just go chill out on, on literally <laughs> on the sea and they do a little surfing or, um, and then when they come back, they're they much better, they, they, they progress. So I think we have this privilege of having both these two uh, opposite realities, but uh, people who enjoy these uh, outdoors activities, both on the sea or on this vertical um, uh, world, uh, I think that you can find in Lisbon uh, a wonderful place where you can even feel um, relaxed. Uh, I'm not talking about the danger like Brazil where you cannot go out with a mobile phone, otherwise they'll steal it from you. No, it's relaxed. Um, I've never felt on all the countries I've climbed in, I never felt, uh, you know, uh, in um, discomfort of uh, lack of safety on the streets. Um, because also, who wants to, to mess with a group of uh, three, four climbers, you know? <laughs> but um, in, in Portugal, it, it, it's, it's something that uh, I still remember. It's like uh, 35 years ago where a young kid can go alone on a bicycle to Serra da Estrela. And it, if, if you are clever enough to, to stay away from big trucks and, and um, if you don't do stupid mistakes, yeah, it's, it's a safe place to, to, to live in. Amazing. Um, Joao, you've also written some books. I mean, just maybe tell us about those. And also, yeah. um, if you could just tell us how people can, can follow you online and, and, and keep up to date with what you're well, doing. Um, I have, I have uh, three books uh, I've wrote with the help of some, some friend, journalist friends. And, and the first talks about me growing up and how I climbed uh, Mount Everest, what happened on this uh, on this um, this expedition where I frostbite my my hands. And after I have a second book, the, this book is called uh, My Zalta Solidão, the highest solitude. And the second one is like uh, My Zalain, um, further beyond something like that. And I talk about 11 expeditions that I've done after uh, climbing Mount Everest, after I've spent almost three months in a hospital uh, recovering from this frostbite. And it was like a need to show people that I, uh, I, I was back in the, in the mountains, you know. And the most important thing in life is never to fall down, but to know how to stand up every time you fall down. And so I, I was the example, the living example that, uh, well, things on Everest didn't go well, but I'm back and I'm back to, to the big mountains uh, because I, I had this need to see where are my limitations. And finally, I, I came to the conclusion that now with the hands like this, it's more difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, so uh, this second book is like, the the eleven expeditions that were already on some blogs, on some some um, some websites, and and the the third book is is the the book that I had to write about completing this this project that took 17, 17 years of my life from the first to the last eight thousander. Um, like I said. 
six uh, six of these mountains took me like 12 years and then in five years only I just finished the eight mountains that I had to, to climb uh, because I had uh, different um, um, conditions you know like professional conditions and and so in this last book, which is called 14, I had to play a little bit around this, this number, this 14. I'm not gonna talk only about 14 mountains. It's boring. It's always, all the climbers is just mountains, mountains. I had to speak about 14 people. Yeah, in my life, I met 14 people, many more. I should put like, uh, 1400 but uh, the number the magic number was 14 so i had to people who helped me become who i am today who helped me on my career because when, when you look inside everything you do it's not only your responsibility it's uh, the influence of people around you and then i had to talk about 14 places in the world because i love to to travel and uh, there is a, a Portuguese writer that says, life is like a book. If you don't travel, it's like you don't open even the first page, you know? So there, there are 14 places in the world that I wanted to share where I was happy and I wanted to share with, with the readers. And there is, I talk about 14 aspects of my of my way of being. And, and sometimes it's aspects of, uh, I like the radios, I like photo and, and, uh, and filming, and uh, I like the, the weather forecast. So all these parallel interests made me a better climber for taking better uh, care of the gear or taking better um, decision. Um, so all, all these, um, things I, I've played around the, 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 the number of 14 made this book a little bit different from, from what I, uh, I've been uh, reading about the other climbers. And the latest uh, book I've, uh, I've done with my wife is still not, it's not printed, but uh, it will be soon. It's, it's a book for uh, crowdfunding to help Nepali professionals that uh, from tracking that that are out of a job, and so um, it's uh, a book called Amada Blam, and Amada Blam is a beautiful mountain in Nepal. It's for me maybe the the most beautiful mountain I've ever seen and climbed, and th there is like um, it's a fifty. It's a small for a juvenile book. And there is uh, 20 illustrations made by, painted by a uh, Polish artist. And it's both in Portuguese and English. And, and it will be on, soon on uh, PPL. It's a platform for crowdfunding so that I can get the most money possible to send to uh, ONG on, on Nepal to, to help all these tracking professionals that... Uh, during this pandemic are literally out of job and um, most of them went back to the farms, to the countryside where they can still have a chicken and grow potatoes or rice. But some of them are still living in Kathmandu with the families and uh, they, are, they are struggling. And I mean, Nepal, I've been so happy uh, many years of my life in Nepal now I feel like this responsibility of helping them back Wonderful so I mean we, we, we'll put some links in, in, our, in our podcast to your books and to also to your social media so that people can be kept up to date yeah. about mm. your, 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 your new launch um, so I know you're on Instagram I think and on LinkedIn uh, I'm I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, okay. and and there is the joagarcia.com, the, the website. We'll we'll put some links in the show notes so that people can can see when that new project is launched and and can support because that'll yeah. be a, it sounds like a wonderful course. Thank yeah. you, Joao. Um, a question that we ask all of our guests: Portugal, the simple life. Why? 
Well, because uh, in my opinion, um, the simple life is, is a, a way of being. Um, like I told you, uh, I have like uh, half genetics from North and South. And people from South are, are known to be doing things slowly, you know. And, and being simple, it's also for me the, the, the biggest lesson I've learned in Nepal. Local people are so simple and it's on that simplicity that they found a shorter path for happiness. You know, the more you have, the more stress you create and the less happy you are. You think people who have a lot of things, they, they think they are happy, but finally they're not. Always struggling with uh, a lot of issues. And uh, I, I've learned that I want to keep having a simple life, um, not having... I mean, it, it's our obligation to be happy. It's not to have a big house or a fast car. No, it's just to be happy. And I've worked so hard to be happy on what I do or to do something that makes me happy. Um, so, yeah, um, Lisbon, Portugal, a simple life. That's me. <laughs> Super. Well said. Joao, thank you. I've, I've absolutely adored this conversation. Um, I look forward to, to, to getting the book and to keeping up to date with what you're going to do next. And, and it's been inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to let you call it. Okay. And that's a wrap. So thank you once again to Joao. And thank you to all of you for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends, give us a thumbs up, and please leave a comment or a review. We'd love to to hear from you. And as we say in Portugal, Forza, welcome to the simple life.